Thank you, Chair, and welcome, Minister. And I rise this afternoon to support Senator Boyan, and indeed I have signed that amendment with him as well. I'm astonished, actually, that there's three presumably county councillors that are in this chamber here today that would be supporting getting rid of the mandatory public meeting from the democratic process. I'm really, really shocked by it. You know, the people of Ireland don't have very much say anymore, and the COVID regulations and the COVID health legislation that has been introduced here has really proved that. And here we are once again attacking the little bit of power that they have with regard to the democratic process, with regard to what can happen in their area going forward. And we're saying, we don't care. We don't care what you think. Oh, if you, it's okay if you can get online. It is okay if you're IT savvy. But there's 500,000 people in this country that can't even read or write. There are people that are living in single farmlands that roads may be put through their farms and they don't know how to protest. It is very easy for big parties to come in here and say, oh, we can have public meetings. But behind every public meeting by an uh, elected official, there could be an agenda. There's no agenda when the county council hold public meetings. It is their role to do that, to inform the citizen of what is going on. When a party holds a, holds a public meeting, there's an agenda there. You don't know what it is, but there is an agenda there. Not everybody will go to a party meeting run by Fianna Fáil or run by Fine Gael or run by the Greens or run by an independent. But if it is run by the county council, people will engage and people have engaged. You're excluding a lot of people from the planning process as a result of the measures that you are bringing in. And that's not what government is about. That is why, I mean, we're here because we're elected. We're elected by the people. And there are certain things that can elect people. Money can elect people. Or the power of the people can elect people. And that is the only thing people have when it comes to local government and deciding what happens to their area, is to get to those public meetings, to make their voices heard. Some of them will not write it down, but they will walk in a door and they will have a word with the, 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 the town planner or the, or the engineers that are attending those meetings. And their voices will get heard. So I'm very surprised here today that some of the people here want to disempower the citizen and disempower the people that they rep uh, represent. And this piece of legislation, this piece of legislation does that. Not holding a mandatory meeting is not empowering all of the people of this state. And I think it's shameful. I think it's important to note that we are doing our best to try and give an opportunity for everybody to have their voices heard in the development plan process. And it's, I think Senator McDowell made a point in relation to uh, predetermined plans. This is not, a, a development plan in particular uh, is a, an open-ended question. It's how, how we would like to see our city and county develop for the, over the next five years. So it's very much an open-ended question. And in that regard, it's important to try and take in all of the views of members of the public uh, in whatever, in using different formats and using different methodologies, and be they using much more partic participative and inclusive methodologies at public meetings or using online forms and using other sources uh, to gather information and data. And I think, you know, I think the point has been made too around the role of, of the strategic policy committees, the LCDCs. I, I wasn't a huge fan of the putting people first uh, 2014 reforms, but they did create good participative structures within which community groups could involve and engage themselves. And I think those, the, we can't discount those in trying to create a, a robust uh, issues paper to set off on the development plan process. So I think, the, I think it's important to, to, um, to make, out that, that, make that point as well. It's also the case that local authorities very much uh, take a very strong sense of pride, both at executive and elected member level, in, the, in their inclusion of groups, of minority groups, uh, I think the issue of, of literacy had, be, had been mentioned. I think it's impor absolutely important that marginalised groups, I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, that, that those, those groups are included in a process where there are issues where they can't 
actually put in written submissions, and I think those are being included. And very, very often is the case. You know, there's uh, at the local authority awards, there's awards there for um, the, the inclusion and participation that local government engages itself in. So I think those are all important as well. I think, as I said, local authorities take a great sense of pride in ensuring that they are including as many people as possible. So I think what really, in summary, I think what we're trying to do here is ensure that uh, in the long term we have as broad a strategy as possible for inclusion, uh, so that the, uh, it's not discounting the option of, of, um, of uh, uh, town hall meetings, uh, but it is offering the opportunity to have a much broader inclusive debate, and that's the use of various different resources. And I, I stress again that uh, within the programme for government, uh, there is an objective there uh, to move away from linear consultation processes to much more participative and inclusive methodologies uh, to, to not just development plans, but for various plans and policies at, at not just local government level, but at every level as well. Gormagot Cahir.